Good evening, everyone. Happy Friday. Thank you so much for coming. So we have a very special evening planned for us. Our illustrious EQXD core team and special friends are with us today to share their personal stories. We're going to keep it a little casual tonight. I just wanted to do some thank yous. We wanted to thank Autodesk Gallery for sponsoring this event and this amazing space. So, <laughs> and all the people and staff that have helped us make this a seamless event. And so uh, after the uh, talks, we will have uh, an additional hour for networking. So you could uh, check out all the amazing innovations that Autodesk Gallery supports. And there will also be a drawing at the end of the talks for Monograph I.O. And I will let Robert talk about that a little more in detail. But please stay, at least for the drawing, if you can. Uh, it is definitely worth your time. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Saskia Dennis Van Deel, who will start the program. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to this great kickoff event for um, the AIA San Francisco's Equity by Design 2016 Symposium. It's really great to see all of you here. So tomorrow is going to be a day that we hope, we know, will inspire you, will engage you. Um, and part of that's going to be the data we present um, based on the research that was done. A big part of that is going to be the sessions and the uh, panels that our amazing thought leaders have put together. But really the biggest part of the day is going to be, um, the biggest part of what will make the day inspiring for all of you is the stories and um, experiences that we share with each other. And I think that's what makes this event unique. I don't know how many of you came in 2014, but it's the willingness really of all of us and everyone here to open themselves up and share their story. So we thought, um, six seven months ago, that it would be good um, for us to kind of set the tone. And so six of us here are going to tell you a story. We're going to tell you a story about our journeys. We're going to tell you a story about the challenges we've faced. We're going to tell you about some of the opportunities that um, we found along the way. And we kind of hope that in doing so, um, that we will inspire you to kind of do the same tonight and tomorrow to um, Share your stories with the people you already know, and maybe with some new folks along the way. Four of us who are going to be presenting tonight are, um, along with Rosa, members of the core team of Equity by Design. Uh, they are my sister friends, uh, Annalise Pitts, uh, Lillian Asperin, Julia Mandel, and I'm Saskia Dennis. Um, but the power of equity has always been with the really remarkable men and women who have engaged with us, who have shared with us, who have opened um, their minds and their hearts to this national conversation we're having. And so we've also asked two women who along the way have moved each of us to action to join us. So Lucy Irwin is here and um, Haya Kader is here all the way from Miami to share her story. So we're all going to tell our story a little bit differently. Um, the original charge was that we were going to do a 20 by 20 Pecha Kucha style presentation and mostly to keep us on track with time. Um, some of you know I'm a presentation coach, so I'm always a little worried about time management. Um, of course, two of us have deviated completely from that because um, we do love to break the rules here at Equity by Design. Um, so I'm going to start, and um, I want to tell you a story about being open to the unexpected because that's kind of what got me here today. Um, people often ask me what, how I got engaged with Equity by Design, and it's funny because Rosa shared a quote with me just this morning in our daily 6 a.m. text exchange, which has become so regular that at 6 a.m. my husband turned to me in bed and said, are you texting Rosa? <laughs> um, but it was a quote that so captured what I'm, what I'm feeling and what I'm sharing tonight. It's a, it's a quote from Lin-Manuel Miranda in the um, Hamilton documentary where he says, quote, we grapple with the paradox that tomorrow isn't promised, but we make plans anyway. And I've made a lot of plans in my life, and that's what I want to tell you about. So I also want to say that these are called Inspire Talks. And I, just for the record, I think it's really hard to be intentionally inspiring. 
In fact, for me, the moments of my life that have been the most inspiring and that have changed me have really been moments that happen kind of by accident by luck, by happenstance. And you know, when I think about my life, I kind of think of it as a series of unexpected collisions with ideas and people. And the cool stuff is what comes after those collisions. And sometimes it's magical, sometimes not so much. Um, but it is in the unexpected that change happens. And so for those of you in the room who know me, and there's some of you who know me quite well, um, you'll, you can tell uh, you know that I don't embrace the unexpected. I'm not one of these people who love spontaneity. Um, and I come by that really honestly. Um, so my mother called me on Tuesday to talk about Christmas. <laughs> Christmas 2017. <laughs> and that seemed perfectly reasonable to me. So I love to plan. I, I plan in an obsessive way and I kind of crawl through my to-do list in 25 minute increments. So, but it's really been those unexpected things that have moved me forward much more than anything I've planned. So in 1987, I arrived in San Francisco with two suitcases. And I ran into a guy at a party on my first weekend here. I was living in the mission. And I told him about my broken heart and my empty bank account. And he said he was an architect and that he needed help typing specs. So I showed up on Sunday morning. And I sat down and I started typing specs. And I typed and I typed and I typed for months. And I watched people as I was typing those specs. I watched these architects do some pretty cool stuff with really cool big fat pencils and big black markers. But I didn't really have an opinion or a plan that involved architecture. My plan was that I was going to go to graduate school. My plan was that I was going to be a lawyer. And the steps to that were pretty clear to me. And so one day, I'm sitting in the lunchroom. And an older, distinguished-looking gentleman, sitting there eating his sandwich, looks up at me. And he says, hi, I'm Joe. Who are you? Two years later, Joe Eshrick won the AIA gold medal. But on that day, we just had a great conversation about books and literature and weird Portuguese authors. He was really into weird Portuguese authors. And he asked me if I'd help him with some of his writing. And so I did. And for the next 11 years, I learned that my love of writing could be of value. And I learned that my love of competition was also of value. And I learned that an amazing series of mentors and champions would change the course of my life and take me down a path that was magical and completely unexpected, a path that I still walk down in slightly different form, but still with an amazing level of passion. So I changed the plan. So now I decided I was going to be the first marketing director partner in a major firm in San Francisco. I was going to become a leader of a practice. On June 3, 1998, I gave birth to a son who is right now a freshman at the University of Oregon. The plan hadn't really changed. He was merely an addition to the plan. And then the unexpected once again happened. I learned that the dedication and devotion that now had limits that that wasn't enough for the people I worked for. I learned that all the mentors and champions in the world can't solve the problem of a sick or sad or sweet two-year-old who now had been joined by a little sister who sometimes was sick or sad or sweet. And I learned that I needed autonomy, I needed freedom and flexibility to be all the things I wanted to be. So I changed the plan. I found a new mentor who understood I grew my own business with him, and I became an expert on the practice of architecture. Most of all, I tried to be a fantastic parent and have all that flexibility that I needed. And for 17 years, that was my truth, that was my path, that was my plan. Seven weeks ago, on September 11th, my husband had a stroke. I was in Europe with our son on a mommy-son pre-college trip. Moments later, I was on a plane back to Portland. And in a flash, the plans that I had made for tomorrow faded to the background, and I became the child of today again. He's recovering, and he's going to return to much of his former life. But our lives have fundamentally changed, and I know, I sense, that a new plan is emerging as my tomorrow evolves. I imagine that there's going to be new mentors, there's going to be new opportunities and new champions along the way, and hopefully some amazing opportunities. And I honestly can't wait to see what that looks like for me. I know at the end of the day, I'll always be a planner at heart. And if any of you want to discuss Christmas 2017, I'm your gal. 
So I want to end with this wish for all of you. There's going to be a lot tomorrow that you've planned. You've planned which sessions you're going to be in. You've planned which breakout groups you're going to go to. You've planned who you're going to have lunch with. But what I want you to be open to is the unexpected that's going to happen in the seams of the symposium, the people you're going to meet that you never knew were out there, and the conversations you're going to have that are going to change your life. Be open to the unexpected. Thank you. So now I want to introduce the wonderful Lucy Irwin. It's been a pleasure getting to know Lucy these last weeks. And she's going to tell a great story titled, Relaunching, Be Brave, Be Tough, Go For It. All right, I'm going to do the power pose that we all learned from whatever Cuddy, what her name is. You know, do this, take a deep breath, we're ready. <laughs> all right, we're looking to see if this is going to advance automatically. Hopefully it is. Okay, Equity by Design asked me to share my story with you, Pecha Kucha style, which means six minutes and 40 seconds, 20 slides, 20 seconds each. What I've learned, this goes by really quick. So this is my first of many firsts I've had this year, and um, this is a story about being tough, being brave, and going for it. So I want you all to go on a risky journey with me. Jump in the boat. You can be in the bikini or the one piece, but hold on tight because it's going to go by quickly. There are going to be rapids ahead, rocks to crash into, and it's going to go by in a flash. At 26, I was probably like many of you, at an ambitious hardworking, determined, super cool architect. <laughs> and I imagined that I, I, could, I was on the fast track and I was going to do it all. At, I imagined that I would be the next Frank Lloyd Wright or Zaha Hadid while also being a mother and a wife. But life takes twists and turns, those unexpected things we're hearing about today, that you can't imagine, I couldn't imagine at 26. I took a big risk and got married and moved to North Carolina. I got a great job there, working for Phil Freelon, who was the designer of the Museum of the African Diaspora here in San Francisco. I worked on fast track airport projects and research facilities and banks. I got great experience. I did my internship years there, and I sat for the exam with my belly out to here and in those days, you're leaning over actual desk with pencils. <laughs> um, after I um, came back to San Francisco and had my first child, I got a job doing high-end residential work, working part-time. It didn't quite feel like that fast track to Frank Lloyd Wright anymore. <laughs> but I stuck with it. And, um, but after my third child, returning to the practice of architecture was daunting. I never stopped thinking like an architect or seeing the world through the eyes of a designer, but I, I kept my license active, paid for it every year, but I couldn't read the magazines or look at who was winning prizes. It was just too painful to be on the outside of something I loved. Between recessions and being fully occupied, taking care of our children, and doing a lot of community service work, years went by. But I continued to work on solving complex problems by looking at for creative solutions. And I took a lot of risks doing things that followed my passion for building stronger communities and um, working for social justice. This is the reunion of the first, the first reunion of the Black Student Union at St. Ignatius High School. I helped coordinate this and we produced a video of the 40 years of the club. And it was a great education about the club, about San Francisco, and determination. I, did, um, I worked on Habitat for Humanity days. I did Rebuilding for Together days. I worked on political campaigns. I did, um, taught sewing to middle school students. I did lots of risky things. <laughs> <laughs> but the risk I want to share with you today is when I decided to return to the practice of architecture. I decided I needed to update my skills, and I took a Revit class. This is how I looked after the first class. <laughs> but I stuck with it, and I realized that my knowledge of how buildings go together 
gave me a leg up. It was really scary telling people I wanted to return to the practice of architecture. Would it work out? Is it possible? But I found equity by design, and I joined the AIA. I joined Organization of Women Architects, and I found mentors. Um, at my first equity by design meeting, I met Pamela Tang, who's a mother who had taken 20 years off to raise her four children. And that gave me so much courage and hope. I can't tell you. So um, I met Rosa and Lillian, and they encouraged and supported and challenged me to develop new skills. And I went to the AIA convention and did my first hackathon. I did over 20 informational interviews, um, talking to architects about how the profession has changed, what continuing education they found most helpful, and what they look for when they're making new hires, what skills they're looking for. This was very humbling to see how much these people had accomplished and their generosity. But through this process, I learned so much about the current practice of architecture and where I might be able to fit into the profession as it is today. Um, and the more I talk to people about how my volunteer work and how it fit in with my ambition to return to the practice, the more comfortable and confident I felt. And going to the, the AIA Seattle Women's Forum and being in this room full of 300 women architects and hearing their stories about how they built their careers and their families was deeply reassuring and inspiring. Every step of this path has been terrifying. Um, but the more I put myself out there, the more comfortable and confident I felt about my ability to relaunch. So um, it gave me the confidence when I had my first, when I had a job interview, I was able to tell my story and uh, ask pertinent questions about the, the position and help the interviewer imagine how they might fit an unconventional applicant like my, myself into their organization. And because I'd done equity by designs, uh, Negotiating workshops, I was able to negotiate a fair wage. <laughs> my, my, my first job was with a really um, uh, high-powered, quick-moving, competitive firm in the city. And in four months, it was like a boot camp. <laughs> I can't um, uh, now I'm looking for another spot that's a better fit, perhaps. Um, uh, but equity by design has given me the courage to dust myself off, get back on the horse, and fight for my spot in this profession that I love. I want to say tomorrow, I hope all of you will put yourselves out there, take some risks in the workshop, and go for it. Be tough, be brave, go for it. Thank you. And I'm going to introduce Lillian Aspirin. Who is going? Who is um, at WRNS and was one of the co-founders of this amazing organization? That's a normal day at the studio. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Lillian Asperin. I'm the co-chair of Equity by Design. I'm excited about the next couple of days. I wanted to tell the story of the last three years. You might have seen a very public side of me, and today you're going to see a little bit of what's informed the last three years and how I navigate it through them. Um, in 2013, um, by every means of success in the profession, I was working on two projects, um, one at USF and one at Utah. Um, lead gold, on budget, um, incredible relationship with the clients, um, just really amazing. I felt at the top of my profession. And January 4th of 2014, my father passed away unexpectedly. Um, my father was my biggest fan. He was the person that I would never dare to disappoint. All of a sudden, I was find myself in the Philippines saying goodbye. It was 8 o'clock that night, and um, it was the sweetest memory I've ever had of my father. Um, what ensued in the next six months um, due to the inheritance process in the Philippines is this. Many, many boxes of many, many papers. Those passport stamps got filled. I was in the Philippines four times over the course of six months. Um, it was the very first time that I just didn't know what else I needed to do. 
My husband um, also was struggling with some health conditions. Um, we found ourselves in the ER three times in two months. He was diagnosed with not one, but two rare conditions. One is life-threatening, and it's compounded by the fact that for you architects in the room, imagine a line down the middle of your body. His organs are all completely reversed. So the sum of those two was incredibly life-threatening. So what happens, this is my life as an architect. There are some major breaks. All of those feelings down there, I felt every day, every hour, every minute. What do I do? Um, it was a perfect storm. I met Rosa at a SCUP conference, and she and I talked about equity by design, the idea of this mission to really support talent in the profession. And I realized, how do we do that? So I started looking outside the profession. So any of you who have done hackathons, you know that I'm a big nerd for hackathons. I've recruited you to do big nerdy things with me, and this was really quite transformational for me. Um, what it led me to do was to figure out a new way of navigating my life. Um, so I started making these maps. These, this first map was one that I did when I gave myself the license to take the summer off. Um, this is the wish map. As a woman of the 21st century, I realized that um, I am me, I was married, what do I want from our partnership and eventually what do I want from my employer? So I started radiating out from these core values. I did another one which is called a feel, be, do map. So what are all these things that these assessments tell you that you are? What are these sweet spots? So I put those in the middle and I wrote to the left, what am I actually feeling when I'm working to my strengths? What am I actually doing on the bottom when I'm working to that sweet spot? And then on the right, how do I get paid to do that? Um, <laughs> So the third map was this convergence map. And here I am in the world, how do I do, how do I acknowledge what gets me up in the morning? And I realized that there's four quadrants of my life and I wanted to embrace all of them. And I wanted to design a life around them. So for me, what matters is education, technology, social justice. I forget the other one, it's supposed to be really important to me. Okay, um, so then we did the survey. <laughs> And the survey said, you know, magically that projects are one thing, but what really matters to all of you is working with a really collaborative team to working on projects that you're really connected to and also um, flexibility. So I remember I've done these maps. I'm thinking about what I want to do. I got this postcard many, many, many years ago, and it was WRNS. What impressed me about this firm is that they launched not with a project or with a client. They launched with the people the people, a, project, a, a photo of people. And it made such an impression on me. And I said, how do I get there? <laughs> and um, they had just been named the number one architecture firm. And I said, what do they want from me? And I said, can I create a story that's about three things that I can give to them? The one is, can I write in one page what I can contribute to that firm? Number two, can I write in another page who I'd like to collaborate with when I'm working in that firm? And the third is, how much do I want to get paid? What does that look like? So I, it gave me the clarity and confidence to actually go back and map a journey forward. So meanwhile, we're doing equity by design. We're designing a day where we're trying to be um, thoughtful about the survey data and creative about solving these knots that need to be untied. This was a really fun experience to design, and I thank you all for being part of that. Um, so about a month ago, we were part of um, the architecture in the city resilience installation, and I realized how much I love uh, making stuff. Um, and I realized that some of the data that we're crunching is really quite messy. And can we design installations where, or experiences where we actually experience elasticity or growth? This is me in the backyard tinkering. Um, I love doing this stuff. And I realized that I haven't been doing enough of that um, recently. I wanted to um, also share, sorry, I'm going to stay close to this. Um, an installation, and the reason we, I wanted to share this is because I think for the next day, you're going to have an opportunity to share um, your point of view. This was an installation where we talked about when things are going well in your profession, what are you actually doing, what's actually helping you, and we asked people to map that in a little card. Conversely, when you're struggling in the profession, what do you need help with? And so we want equity by design and every opportunity that we put together to be an opportunity for you to give and take. I wanted to end with two stories of women in equity by design that have also inspired me. Um, Sharon Portnoy was a, was a mom, she had a profession. Uh, she had her own practice and she was really interested in coming back. It was interesting to me when she came back that she said, I don't know Revit, I'm deficient in this. She kept pointing out the negatives and um, she came back and now she's really joyfully employed with a person that she met at the last year's symposium. Um, Prana Gupta, who I think is in the room, 
Yes. Um, she was uh, just married, and as a project manager, I asked myself, how can I bring equity by design and flexibility to the experience of uh, someone who just got married? Um, so we figured out how, how to create tools within our project to create that flexibility and to engage people in a different way. Um, I would be remiss to not be thankful for all the people that um, have helped me navigate my story of resilience. You know who you are, and I thank you. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Annalisa Pitts. Um, your dad is right there. So incredibly proud of you. Um, <laughs> it's part of embarrassing you. Um, she is um, an amazing leader, and um, she has been the research chair for this year's symposium. Um, the title of her presentation is How I Learned to Love Work. Please welcome Annalisa. All right. Seriously, who brings their dad to their professional conference? Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so after three years of grueling hours and crippling self-doubt, architecture school had taught me that success in architecture hinged upon projecting strength, especially when I felt the most vulnerable. Uh, still, this was a breaking point. It was eight weeks before graduation day, and my thesis advisor had just told I didn't even launch this thing. Um, we're going to go. So we're gonna fast forward soon. But anyway, so it was eight weeks before graduation day and my thesis advisor had just told me that my project was unlikely to be finished in time for me to graduate with the rest of my class. I couldn't hold back any longer and so I sobbed right in front of him. I needed to graduate, I told him. The last three years had been emotionally draining and I was more than ready to move on with my life. If he would just give me the chance, I promised that I could finish strongly. But how had I gotten myself here in the first place? I had arrived to graduate school a confident 22-year-old. I had a degree from an elite university where I had tried and excelled in fields from theoretical mathematics to leading an a cappella group. <laughs> I was ambitious and adventurous, always ready to take on new challenges and push the limits of my abilities. And so when I left my family and friends behind and moved halfway across the country to start graduate school, it honestly never occurred to me that I wouldn't be at the top of my class, let alone incap incapable of keeping up with my peers. The reality check was swift and severe, and you see it up there on the wall. Many of my classmates had fine arts backgrounds, and the relative clumsiness of my early work made me feel weak, vulnerable, and like I didn't belong. Meanwhile, as a humanities major, I had never experienced the vulnerability of having unfinished work out on display for everyone to see. As I sat and judged my own weeks, weak works in progress, I was afraid that my instructors and classmates were thinking the same thing. There's that weak girl who clearly doesn't belong here. And so I left studio every night, comforting myself at home with phone conversations with my boyfriend, not realizing that my classmates were working late into the night. By the time that my first mid-review rolled around, it was clear to me that I had fallen so far behind my classmates that catching up seemed impossible. And so I resolved to work harder, realizing that my fear of failure had kept me from even trying. And so I worked, eight, 10, 12, 14, and then 20 hour days. For the first time in my life, I was working as hard as I could just to keep up, just to be average. I hoped to make it through my next mid-review without embarrassing myself any further. In this context and doubting my, self -judgment, my own judgment, the opinions of others became incredibly important to me. But the gold star that I so desperately wanted never came. In reviews, my classmates who were considered more talented tended to receive feedback on their work. When criticism was levied, it was about a provocative issue raised, maybe a question left unresolved. Meanwhile, my reviews felt more personal. When critics told me that I was too tentative, my drawings too delicate, what I heard was that they were seeing through all of my efforts and into my deepest fears, that my weak work was the result of irredeemable personal failings. And so I began to internalize an idea that in architecture, there were those who had talent that was worth cultivating, and the rest of us, and that included me, uh, could try as hard as we wanted, but we would never produce anything of value. In retrospect, there was a gendered pattern to these reviews, with women more likely to hear about their process or their personalities, and male respondents more likely to hear about um, the content of their ideas. <laughs> However, seeing this pattern didn't do anything to make me feel better, and it certainly didn't make me feel welcome in my chosen field. And so I began working hard to convince critics to engage with my ideas. 
By entering into detailed explorations of context, I was able to develop parameters against which I could judge my own work. Was it responsive to its circumstances? Would it help an end user to better engage with the place and its history? With these tools, um, I was able to start to cultivate my own values as a designer. Classmates began taking interest in my work and offering helpful feedback, and I stopped dreading, uh, dreading desk crits. Still, I had a long way to go, and I was hardly a superstar. When critics told me that in reviews, some critics still refused to engage with my work, giving me helpful feedback like that my work wasn't architectonic, or that my drawings were pretty, but they weren't architecture. These comments had the effect of shutting me down without telling me what I was doing wrong, and they didn't give me the tools that I needed to move forward. Given my history to date, perhaps it's fitting that my final studio was organized by a faculty member who believed that I was a weak student. Every day it felt like he was challenging me to fail. My project was a, was a cenotaph for the author Italo Calvino. It was an exploration of how we as architects read drawings, stories, and cities, and how those readings can help to, to inform a sense of connection between the process of making and the process of reading a place and experiencing it as an end user. Calvino himself said it best when he wrote, I think we are always searching for something hidden or merely potential or hypothetical, following its traces whenever they appear on the surface, that which connects the visible trace to the invisible thing, the absent thing, the thing that is desired or feared, like a frail emergency bridge flung across an abyss. I believed that like literature, architecture could act as this frail emergency bridge, offering a palpable connection between the process of making and the process of experiencing place. Not architecture as some magical, perfect, preformed object dropped onto a site by a, a lone wolf designer, but an architecture of openness, vulnerability, and radical connection, or something like that. <laughs> in that still, I didn't articulate any of that in that terrible mid-review that ended in tears. Instead, I pre presented site analysis, endless, endless diagrams, tentative sketches of a building. But most of all, I just begged my professor silently to tell me that my project was good enough, that I was good enough, and I didn't get their seal of approval. Still, the meeting was productive. After years of trying to protect myself from feeling like a failure, my breakdown that day changed something from me. When I went home, washed my face, and returned to studio prepared to try again, I was finally able to see that I could completely admit failure within a moment without actually being a failure. Over the next, the next eight weeks were exhilarating and exhausting. Having finally been freed from my fears, I was able to dive wholeheartedly into my work. After many late nights and early mornings at my drafting board, I began to feel my project taking on a life outside of me. It was messy and complicated, and it posed more questions than I possibly had time to answer, but I loved every bit of it. And so in the end, the final review went really well, and I did indeed graduate on time, but that wasn't really the point. <laughs> I had learned that in architecture, um, what had I learned? I had this. <laughs> okay, I think that what I had learned <laughs> was that in order to allow my projects to become, in order to be able to hear my projects tell me what, I, what they wanted to become, I had to be able to silence my fears and my feelings that I wasn't, I wasn't worthy of producing good work. I had found that, um, I had found that I needed to be open and vulnerable, but ultimately that there would come a time when I needed to let go and allow my projects to take on a life outside of me. And in the end, this was worth so much more than the gold star I finally received. Oh, and up next we have Haya Kate. Oh. Okay, so up next we have Haya Cater, who is going to be presenting Design as a Compass for Conscious Living. Earlier this year, I was invited to serve in my architecture school's alumni council. So last month, I visited my alma mater for what was to be the first meeting of my term. During the introductions, and as we shared a brief synopsis of our backgrounds and journeys, I could immediately feel the enthusiasm among my peers to welcome this rare breed of Costa Rican, Latin, Jewish woman architect into their midst. For the first time in my life, I saw my identity 
um, uh, in an architecture setting as a cause for celebration instead of mitigation. Mind you, I wasn't gonna get any jobs out of that setting, but it finally dawned on me that instead of downplaying my identity as I did for decades so that I would be deemed a real architect, I could potentially capitalize on what unique qualities I may contribute to this profession that has been long dominated by men. So I could spend the next five minutes sharing how I was able to overcome my traditional Latin Jewish gender programming, starting with how I was able to get my father's blessing to follow my passions to yet another so unnecessary for a woman, three and a half years of graduate study in the USA, or share perhaps how in keeping with my program, I got married at 22 and graduated from the GSD while nursing my baby daughter and pregnant with my son, or how I spent 25 years in a dual existence, as mother, as homemaker and mother of four children on one hand and architect on the other, constantly juggling the two and afraid to be judged on one hand and not taken seriously on the other. <laughs> Or I can tell you how, for years, I wore blinders or played dumb when confronted with constant bias, gender bias, as even my most loved ones would refer to the practice that I set out to start from my attic as a great venue for my entertainment so that I wouldn't be bored with my household chores. Oh, I could also share how I suffered from back pain and neck pain for years, and even subjected myself to neck surgery as a last and desperate effort to pretend that I could do it all and under the semblance of perfection. But instead, I am excited to share with you what has been the greatest gift that a profession in architecture has yielded. You may think that it is the um, structures that I have helped my clients build over the years, or running into them at odd places and being celebrated with excitement as they share the joys of living in their homes, or the thrill and excitement of running a small studio um, with individuals that grace my very existence, or the thrill and excitement of being engaged in the design process, but no. The greatest gift that design have given me, has given me were the tools that I needed to get off the course of a scripted life and find the courage to design my own. And how that happened bears the subject of my talk, Design as Compass for Conscious Living. See, when I started my practice, the prospect of a new project would trigger this sense of panic as I would try, even before I was hired, to come up with a heroic design to the problem at hand, with a vision, so to speak, or a master solution. With time, I learned that humility was the best tool at hand, to recognize that I had no idea what the project was gonna turn out to be, and to surrender to a process of exploration and discovery that would always yield the best results. Not too long ago, I understood, I'm oh, sorry, that was, okay, whatever, that, that comes next. <laughs> <laughs> Not too long ago, I understood that the reason for my physical pain and lack of fulfillment in my personal life was the result of my trying to live according to a preconceived plan of what life ought to be, to what my role as woman entailed. It was as though I was, I was insisting on living my life based on a sketch, or actually a whole set of blueprints that were drafted way before I had the chance to explore the project at hand. In this case, none other than my life. So I wonder what it would be like to get off the script. I began this process of personal healing, transformation, and emancipation. Um, 
and I realized that my circumstances were the result of choices that I had made by taking cues from my cultural bias and background. But what was most shocking with this new awareness was to discover that there were similar narratives in our profession. Many became evident in the last few years with two <laughs> uh, remarkable and yet poignant uh, poignant um, gold medals at the AIA and the work of Equity by Design. I have personally felt the ripple effects across the architectural um, uh, spectrum of leadership. Um, last summer, this, uh, this past summer, I was asked to convene a 25-minute tabletop discussion on the topic a more diverse profession and AIA at the Knowledge Leadership Assembly in DC. It was disappointing that only four people showed up, one man, but it was commendable that the subject made it to the agenda for the first time. During my council meeting, um, we were asked to um, share stories that would engage the GSD with the public at large. I shared the story of how women in design at the GSD started the petition for Denise Scott Brown and the Pritzker in 2013, and my male peers chose that story as the one to be shared with the rest of the council, and without any prompting from me, they described the conflict of the story as misogyny in the field. <laughs> And finally, um, as the only woman member of the Committee on Design at the AIA, I missed the last conference, but I was happy to receive the meeting minutes in which this statement popped as one of the items in the minutes. We need to increase women participation in the COD, and we need more women in COD leadership. So could it be possible that we are finally being welcomed in this profession? And if so, is there something that we're gonna contribute that is gonna be different? Because frankly, I don't wanna leave one scripted narrative to step into another one. I wonder if there's a way that we can help manifest a culture in architecture where we don't have to compromise our innate feminine qualities in order to, to compete in a man's world. I wonder if we can stay true to ourselves and navigate this profession with grace, a call to service, and to follow our intuition to enhance creativity. Given the state of our profession, I am grateful to Equity by Design for providing tools for exploration, for culture transformation. And sometimes when we're confronted with an extraordinary task in front of us, um, humor serves as segue. So I end with a picture of me and my studio director and as a symbol of this cultural shift that we hope to see in our profession, we've instituted this strict policy in my studio where only pink hard hats are allowed at all of our construction sites. Thank you so much for listening. And now I would like to introduce our last presenter, Julia Mandel, and she's gonna tell us about a new dream. Okay. A month after I graduated from architecture school, I landed my dream job. Brimming with ambition, I sought out a firm whose award-winning work was exactly in line with the landscape urbanism ideas I had studied in my thesis, and I knocked on their door. I ardently made a successful case for myself. So I had done it. I had parlayed academic ambition into real-life work where I could both design at a high level and make a difference in exactly the way that mattered most to me at the time. This was a hard-driving firm where it was understood the design took dedication and long hours. We got to work early, we stayed late. On deadline, teams would work 18-hour days for weeks at a time. It was intense and all-encompassing, and at first, I loved it. 
But as the months passed, I began to notice some things. We worked all hours on deadline because my manager didn't know how to organize our time and would underestimate what was needed on the project <laughs> until the last minute. <laughs> on top of that, the principal in charge would regularly make major changes the night before the drawings were due. I'm seeing some nods in the audience, actually. <laughs> there was always more work to be done than could be finished in a regular day. And if you were good, multiple principals were fighting over your time, piling on the projects. Mid-career professionals rarely saw their children, as far as I could tell. At least saw them awake. And <laughs> there was high turnover. Junior staff, especially the best ones, the ones who were the hardest working and the most talented, regularly left often to leave the profession altogether. So there's all of that. And then it was also 2008. <laughs> so you all know this story. I graduated eight months before the bubble burst. In the fall of that year, all of our domestic developer work dried up, and most of our public projects were put on long-term hold. A few months later, more than half the staff was let go. Those of us who remained were shell-shocked and terrified. I remember doing calculations about how long I could sleep on friends' couches before I would have to show up on my parents' doorstep half a country away, 30 homeless and broke. And the project budgets kept getting tighter and the demands on staff more onerous. All the problems I just described intensified and you couldn't say no or you'd be out of a job. So we soldiered on. I lasted four years before burnout caught up with me and the market lifted enough that I felt safe to make a move. Things are much better now. <laughs> my new job is very different. I work for a small family-run design-build development firm. We're also in a boom real estate market. The demands are a lot less intense in terms of schedule and profit. We work hard, but the wolf is not at the door. But the thing is, that job, that crazy nightmare job, it was exactly what I expected. I'd been taught in school, just like Annalisa, that you were supposed to work 24-7, that you were supposed to sacrifice everything for design. In school, it mostly seemed worth it. I was in love with the challenge of the projects, the drama and excitement of the late nights, the close call on deadline. I was also young enough that I had no commitments except to myself, and young enough to want things that way. I'd also been taught in school that the way to be an architect was to start your own firm, to uh, join, enter competitions, to make it big as an individual, your own ideas and your name, just you. It made sense. It's how we were being taught to work alone. It's how the architects that we were revered were written about and discussed. It's how our professors worked. Sometimes the model would expand slightly. You'd have two people, maybe three, <laughs> that was pretty much it, and, and usually there was still one personality who was featured on the forefront. Anyone else who worked on a project was nameless, expendable. Young, hungry postgrads who could put up with exploitation for a few years before they took their own shot at success. Success that would take years and years of studio-level hard work, endless charrettes and late nights. There are a lot of reasons for this, and we'll get to that. <laughs> so, so, given all of that, I thought this was the way it was. I thought this was the way it would always be. And until recently, I still thought that's the way it was. Because my current job is in a related profession, I was under the impression that if I went back to a regular architectural services firm, especially one with ambitions about design, it would be that way again that while my postgrad experience may have been particularly harrowing because of the recession, it was still a mirror of the status quo. And it was equity by design that really opened my eyes to how much I believed this, to how much I worried about my future and whether architecture could give me the life that I wanted. When I quit that curdled dream job, I thought about leaving the profession and I was still thinking about it when I arrived at Equity by Design. I got involved in 2014 because I was appalled by the numbers. I didn't think too hard about myself at the time. I was still practicing pretty much, and I hadn't experienced major, major discrimination. I was usually the only woman in the room, 
but I was still in the room. But through Equity by Design, I've heard partners at firms talk about how important their employees are, how nurturing their ambitions and their skills is a monetary investment in the future of the firm. I'd never heard firm leaders talk that way before. I didn't know there were places I could work where my long-term goals were of value and interest, where I was of interest beyond staffing the next project. Through Equity by Design, I also have heard a younger colleague talk about a firm where senior associates who worked less than full time for a number of years to raise children had gone on to make partner. She talked about this like it was expected and, and good, something that the firm worked hard to make viable because the women were talented and valuable. I didn't know such a thing existed. How strongly I disbelieved the possibility of it when I heard it showed me how strongly I believed that my desire to have children would hinder my career. There are many reasons, many factors, that account for the still dismal numbers of women that make it all the way through a career in architecture, and other factors that keep the field overwhelmingly white. But I think this story, the story I lived, the story I learned in school about what it means to be an architect, is part of the problem. The sole genius artist, not architect, the artist, because that's really what we're talking about, who works alone <laughs> and has their creative visions all by themselves and doesn't think about anyone else, that's an old story. It's a figure that we've revered, revered for a long time. He was around long before women and people of color were allowed in the studio for the centuries when women's domestic work allowed his solo venture to be possible. Most of us don't live that way anymore, and many of us, especially women, don't want to. There's no room in that story for collaboration, for community and family, for helping others rise. I've come to see how narrow and hopeless my own thinking was, how little I trusted that architecture could give me the life I wanted. I'm no longer committed to just myself, and I no longer want to be. Equity by Design and all of you have given me hope that we could have a different future, though I still think I'll have to fight for it. Wow, that's all I could say. <laughs> My heart's fluttering, because I know all these women so well, and yet I didn't know these stories, <laughs> and I'm embarrassed. But I'm proud of uh, all of you for being brave enough to share your stories, and I also encourage all of you that are attending the symposium to be open to sharing your stories with people that you're just meeting for the first time, because I think it's that important to be vulnerable as the start of healing and creation and making that new plan, that new life for yourself. So now we have the exciting part of the program where we have a drawing and I think somebody has been helping me collect the raffle tickets. Yay, Zara! <laughs> so before we do the drawing, everybody's gonna wonder, what the heck am I going to be winning? Right? So without further ado, our, I don't know why this is rotated, but I'm going to unrotate it. I'm going to have Robert Yuan, who is one of the principals of, oh my goodness, I am so sorry. <laughs> Lack of sleep here. Okay, here, one more try. Yes, full screen. All right, full screen mode. Without further ado, Robert will, who is also trained as an architect, has gone on this courageous exploration to help other architects realize their vision. Robert. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, so my name is Robert. I'm a, I was an architectural designer. I am an educator, an entrepreneur, and a co-founder of Monograph.io. Now, coming into this, Rosa asked if I can sponsor, which I absolutely am delighted to sponsor, um, and to give a one-minute elevator pitch. 
but how could I, how, how could I sell you anything after tonight's presentation? <laughs> it, it's, it's unjustful. So I'm gonna cut it short. We build websites for architects. That's all we do. That's all Monograph is. Our team is architects, and we've designed technology to help you build your website simply, easily, without any code. That is it. I hope to help, and I'm not going to take more time from the stage. <laughs> let's, let's find out who our winners are tonight, right? I should, yes. They're one-year subscriptions, free to the platform, all of 2017. The first number, four, three, four, <laughs> nine, nine, two. <laughs> we got a winner. We'll have all the winners come up and we'll take a photo. Okay. Thank you. Second number? We have four, three, four, nine, eight, nine. Yeah. And the final four, three, five, zero, one, two. Zero. A round of applause for all the winners. Okay, so uh, the gallery is open to 8 p.m. And I believe some of you have signed up for the EQX Dynabouts. So you should have gotten an email if you did sign up for that to meet with your table mates. And we hope that you enjoy the evening. Tomorrow, but don't stay out too late because tomorrow we start at 8 sharp. For, luckily, if you've registered already, you could come a little bit later, but breakfast will be served between 8 and 9 and the program will start at nine sharp. No, but we're not waiting for anybody. So I know some of you will be hanging out late at night, Gabrielle. <laughs> Behave. <laughs> Thank you again for um, coming to the Autodesk open reception and we hope you have a wonderful evening. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.